Hello, welcome to the Parenting Program Show. I am your host, Jeremy, the Kung Fu Guy. I am a force of nature married to another force of nature. Her name is Autumn. And we have two amazing explosive balls of energy called kids. I am a speaker, teacher, author, catalyst, and Kung Fu master here to help you empower your kids to speak up and own their voice. We're going to unlock and remove the chains of childhood that seem to hold us from our destiny with the tools to have inner strength, confidence to speak up, be heard, and be understood. Let's go play. Game on, yo. Hello, Parenting Nation, and welcome to January of 2020. Brand new year. Some people say a brand new decade, brand new, a whole bunch of stuff truth is every day is a new beginning if you choose it to be so what i'm here today to talk to you about you guys are going to want to listen because i'm actually going to cover the reasons why people don't change situations don't change and how do you apply that to your kids and i'm going to tell you you definitely want to check out the youtube version of this because this is going to have some graphic overlays and some discussion and i'm going to be using all the letters a b c d e f g h I'm going to use all of those letters to talk about change, talk about why people don't change. And again, like I said, how to help your kids to actually do make change and improve the quality of their lives. And uh, full disclosure, I have actually been sick the past two weeks. Uh, well, not me sick, my whole family, actually. Um, the last couple of days, I'm not sick. I've just been feeling a bit run down, as it were. And I don't know if you're, you might hear Autumn coughing in the background in the other room through a closed door. She's halfway across the house, but yeah, it's pretty powerful. Um, I don't have exactly what she's got going on, but I do have a little bit of the raspy throat, occasionally cough. So we're going to go through, do our best to make sure this is good quality audio. And without further ado, let's get to why people don't change, what we can do about it, and how we can help our kids. So first thing, let's talk about change. Right? Let's get to the. Let's get to an understanding. Change does not equal growth. Change just means things are different. That's all change means. Growth means you're actually out of the situation. You've expanded beyond. You have more capacity, more availability, more resources, more resourcefulness. Okay, so let's make a distinction there and let's say that change does not equal growth. Growth equals growth. Change equals change. And so we're going to walk through really quick just the main processes of change. And we're going to begin in position A. And position A is what I like to call your mental capacity equals your life conditions, a.k.a. <coughs> excuse me, you can handle your stuff. And that's really the idea that however life is going for you, whatever standard of living you're used to, your mental capacity, which is what you have inside, and your life conditions, which is what's going on outside, they're in equilibrium. They're in balance. And as long as that's in balance, life is okay. Life could be amazing. Life could be whatever. But you're, you're at homeostasis. You're at a balance point. So the next step is get to position B. Roll the clock forward a little bit. Move forward in time. And when you get to position B, that's when life is going to change. And, and that could be any form of change. It could be being potty trained. It could be graduating school. It could be graduating college, getting married, getting divorced, having a child, going to a funeral, going to a wedding, going to a dance. Any form of change that brings your life out of balance. So the idea of B, B is you anticipate your balance going away. You anticipate something's going to happen. And what most of us do is we don't really prepare for that change in advance. And so we fall into position C. And position C is all about pain. It's all about difficulty and struggle and why me and poor me and all the different adventures of it all because we didn't have a strategy. We didn't have a way to deal with the change. So we get to experience the consequences good, bad, or sideways, most of us have pain. It's not, not a good feeling. And how far down are you going to go? Really, it's your, your decision. And it comes down to position D. Position D is when you decide how I'm living is not who I am. How I want to be, the standard I hold for myself, is somewhere else. And you begin to shift your identity. And I will tell you that some people get stuck down in position D and that becomes their new identity. And, and you'll hear this when people say things like, I am, uh, my name is Joe and I have, you know, my name is John and I'm an alcoholic or I'm a smoker or I'm a drug addict or I'm a whatever, right? Their, their identity gets tied to that level. They just kind of trade one addiction for another. So do you really want to be, I'm an alcoholic or 
I had a problem with alcohol at one point in my life, but now I'm in control. Which is the better story to tell? Okay. So we get to position D is we decide, I don't want to be here anymore. Uh, this is not who I am, how I'm living. I want to be different. And that's where we begin to change. That's that E. E is we begin to make changes. We begin to get our life back. And we get it back up, crawl out of the hole. And then finally, life is how it used to be. My mental capacity equals my life condition. Yay. Problem. What happens when that change shows up again? Because I haven't elevated my strategies. I haven't gotten any better. Right? You'll see this when people are dating and they're dating somebody and they didn't really look at values, uh, team fit, you know, what was your life goals? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. What was your mission? What was the things that matter to you? Really, most people get into dating. It's based on three factors. Number one is chemistry. Are you hot and do I feel something? Right? Number one is chemistry. Number two, proximity. We're in close relationship to each other. And number three is convenience. Your schedule, my schedule, and match. And so because of that, chemistry, convenience, and proximity get into this relationship. And then you find out, oh, values don't match. Oh, there's no real team fit. Yeah, this person can, but they don't want to sacrifice for anybody else but themselves. They expect everybody to sacrifice for them. That's not how I want to live my life. That's not the relationship I want. And so eventually that relationship falls apart. And if we don't elevate our strategies, if we don't try and figure out why did it break apart, what could I do different, how am I going to show up stronger next time, if it's just getting back to, I finally feel stable in myself again, I feel back to how life used to be, and you know, I dated a brunette, and then you know what, no more brunettes, I'm, I'm dating blondes. But strategy doesn't change. It's still proximity, convenience, and chemistry. If we stay in that place, date brunettes, date blondes, date redheads, it's not gonna work. It doesn't matter the, the hair color. It's about values. It's about team fit. It's about overlap, it's about how do you bring passion to each other's life? How do you bring differences? But then how do you create overlap and how do you share commonalities, right? The commonalities create love and the differences create passion. You need a little bit of both to have the best relationship. If you want a high passion, high dynamic, high intimate, high comfort relationship, you've got to understand where's your similarities and where's your differences. Where is that matching and where is that opposite so that you can create that dynamic tension that's going to enrich both of your lives takes a little bit of work sometimes but if we don't elevate our strategies we're just going to skip along sideways so we really want to understand getting back to how it used to be isn't good enough and this is one of the problems that people cause themselves without realizing it is they get back to feeling stable inside themselves they changed which is good but they didn't improve they didn't grow beyond their capabilities. They just got back to even keel. I feel stable again. And this is why you'll see people repeat these patterns time and time again, year after year, relationship after relationship. You'll see people repeating these problems simply because strategies didn't elevate. Okay? So now how does this help your kids? <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> do not like feeling uncomfortable. So one of the ways we can help our kids is, you know, when they start to lose their footing, they had a peer group. Um, a lot of times 10 to 12 is a lot of instability and a lot of that pain falling into that CDE stuff. <clears throat> we want to help draw our kids to noticing their resourcefulness, not give them resources because that keeps them attached to us. How can we help them unlock what have they learned? How have they grown? How are they going to apply this for the future? What standards could they hold for themselves and for others? What warning signs did they see? What musts are there, how they show up, how they expect other people to show up? What are their must nevers? What are the do deal breakers? What are the rule breaks that says, no, any of my must never show up, I'm out. That's my eject button. Whether it's a friendship, it's an intimate or dating relationship, whether it's a mentorship, whatever the case. And the same questions you can ask for you and your partner, your spouse, your significant other. You know, what are our deal breakers? What are our must nevers for friends, for, for friendship, for mentoring, for business, for job, career? Really get clear on those things. And not you need anybody's permission, not that you need to apologize for having your standards, just gotta be clear. Now, the next question then is once we start to understand, okay, even keel feeling that's good, but it's not enough, we gotta go to that next level. And we gotta do what's called an identity shift. And we really have to decide and get clear on what is our compelling future. 
So, you know, beginning of the year is a great time to do this, but really any time is a great time to do it. Get clear on your compelling future. What is that higher level thing, right? What is the magic of thinking big? What's the big idea that draws you, pulls you? It's going to elevate you. Like to, for me to achieve at this level, I have to grow and I have to become. I have to do more, be more, give more so that I can receive more. So you've got to make yourself bigger, more expanded. If you want the universe to bring more to you, then you've got to put more good stuff out there too. It's an equal, equal energy. You can't just say, I want to receive all goodness, but give nothing back. Nature abhors that, right? Nature will crush that, right? It's always a flow. When you give, then you can receive. And you can't control what you're given. You can only control what you give out. So in the diagram, we get to A, B, C, D, E, F, F is the identity shift. G is the actual growth. But before we grow, we got to have that H in place first. We got to say, what is our compelling future? What is the thing? And it doesn't have to be the grand sum total of your life. It could just be the next phase, the next evolution, the next quantum of energy, that next stage in that overall opera, that overall story, that overall movie, that overall whatever phrase gets you the most juiced. But what is the thing that if you could accomplish this next milestone, everything would begin to change? And you could break that the compelling future. You could look at it in six areas. Physical compelling future. I'll be able to run a marathon. I want to be able to, well, I want to be able to finish a marathon. That's one. I want to be able to run a marathon. That's two. I want to be able to race a marathon. That's three. Those are very, very different goals. And having completed a marathon, I will tell you, I don't want to run another 26.2 miles. That wasn't fun. It was, we got through it and we got it done. But after about mile 18, it sucked. So Autumn and I were like, hey, we could do like a half marathon. So we were like, maybe we should do like a, a sprint try or a you know, half distance try. That'd be kind of fun. Sprint is about a quarter of a distance. So they do a triathlon. That might be fun to do. So we have set, set some goals on that, right? But physical goals. What's a physical compelling future? For some of you, it might be just be able to get out of bed without making the sound like a bowl of Rice Krispies, snap, crackle, and pop. Mentally, what is a compelling future? Reading, understanding new knowledge, gaining wisdom, gaining insight. Emotional, what's a compelling future emotionally? What would draw you forward in your head and in your heart? Number four, spiritually. What would be a meaningful goal to you? Donating time, donating to charity, raising money for some worthy cause, volunteering, going on mission work? What would be something that's compelling to you that would draw your resources and challenge you and grow you? And then on the other side, so I like to do it like this. Physically is my pinky. Mentally is my ring finger. Emotionally is my middle finger. <laughs> Spiritually is the index finger. And then financially is over here. And so what would be a financial goal that would be meaningful to you? Maybe it's make an extra $500 a month or an extra $10 a week or an extra $1,000 a week. I don't know what's meaningful for you. But what would be a compelling future? What would be something that would be worthy of going after and challenging? And then what bridges the gap between these two, the inner and the outer, is the relationships. And what would be a meaningful goal for you in your relationships? And we break relationships into three parts, personally, professionally, and intimately. So in your intimate relationships, if you're a you know, grown up, it might be your significant other, your spouse, your partner. If you're a, a kid, then teenager, we're talking about your family, right? Personally, it was your friends. And then professionally, be the people you work with. And if you're at school, it would be your classmates, your teachers, right? Your professional network. So what would be some meaningful goals? What would be some compelling futures? And you don't have to have one answer for all those dimensions, I mean, if you want to, that's great. Full court press, be my guest. But I found a lot of times when you're working on a new skill, it's better if you pick just one area and build and create success. Then as you do that, you now have a platform or a model you can use in other areas also. So once you have your compelling future, that sits up at the top of this whole entire checkmark diagram thing that you'll see if you're watching the YouTube video versus listening on the, on the podcast audio version. But then you have G. G is the actual growth process. And the secret to growth, just so I can show you guys, right? The secret to growth is that we want to have small little successes in the beginning. Little achievable, measurable, I got that, I got that, I got that, I got that. Set yourself a series of small little successes so that as you do that, then you begin to take bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger chunks up to that compelling future, right? 
when I work with a family in the martial arts school and I have a young kid who's not used to having discipline or being responsible around chores, I'm like, great, let's find some quick, easy successes. Brush your teeth all by yourself. That's one. Take a shower all by yourself or a bath. That's two. Uh, put, a, uh, put on your pajamas. That's three. Uh, set out your clothes for tomorrow. That's four. After a couple of months, though, do we really need to give you every single one of those as an individual thing? Or is it all of that clusters into get ready for bed? And now we've got four tasks tied in to that earning a stripe instead of four individual tasks. Because you're getting more capable, you're getting more competent, we're going to raise the standards. Which also means mommy and daddy can trust you to do more stuff. And the kid goes, wait, what? Yeah, you get more freedom, dude. If you show us you can handle this, then we can give you more opportunity. Really, Merlin? Really? This is my blind cat, Merlin, for those of you joining me. Uh, come here. And he's like behind me, climbing up on the chair. He always wants to see. Somehow he knows when we're filming, and he always wants to see what's going on. And I'm like, dude, you're blind. You literally can't see. Like, literally, you cannot see. Yeah, I love you, too. Yes. 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 Okay, so he's going to go back now. Yeah, that's a great segue into, now how do we apply this for our kids? When your kids are young, you have to define some of that compelling future. You have to set some goals and standards. And when I say young, I mean below 13 to 15 years old. Right? I had a family, and they had an 8-year-old. and We were talking with him about leadership and black belt and committing to our longer-term programs. And mom and dad are like, well, if he wants to do it, and I was like, respectfully, you're the grown-ups, you're the adults, you need to make some decisions for him first. And they were like, well, no, we don't want to have to force him to go do this thing. And I'm like, do you like your job all the time? Do you like your marriage all the time? Or sometimes you got to remind yourself, you look at that ring and be like, oh, yeah. So commitment is a skill we have to practice. And we do it by making commitments and then following through. And we're not always going to feel like we want to do the thing that we committed to all the time. That's normal. I love what I do. Kung Fu master, teacher, author, speaker. I, I absolutely love it. Doesn't mean I want to do it every single day. Some days, I just want to stay in bed, nerf the world. I'm tired. I want to sleep because we're still human beings. And if I have a parent tell me, well, I don't want to force my kid, I'm like, mm, do they have to eat their vegetables? Do they have to take a shower? Do they have to bathe? Do they have to go to school? You make them do stuff because you make certain decisions that as a family, this is what we hold sacred. And if you make that decision, you give their kids something to model off of. And that's also why, like in my martial arts school, our basic program, we have about a year to figure out if this is going to be an important goal. And if we have a kid who's engaged, a couple of months into the program, we know, yeah, you're, you should be in leadership. You should be a black belt. This is a kid who's committed. It's just a matter of maintaining that motivation because motivation is a skill. It's not a one time you decide and you never have to think of it again. I mean, I'm sure there's people who can do that. They're very few and far between. But us mere mortals... We make a decision, then sometimes we have to remind ourselves why we did this. Why did I make this decision? What was that bigger vision, that compelling future? What was that meaningful goal that that's why I decided to do this thing and I thought this was the best vehicle to get there? Now, the reason I said that you have, you have to make these decisions as a parent for your kids between 13 and 15 is really 13, and 15, 13 to 15 is when our kids have the mental and emotional capacity to start going after their own goals and be self-starters and be motivated to go for themselves. Now, that doesn't mean that kids younger than that can't do that. They can. But that's not the norm. The norm is 13 to 15. Younger than that, we as adults have to make some decisions for our kids and then hold them accountable to that. You know, you can ask the question, hey, did you have fun? Did you like it? Do you want to do this for a while? Yes. Okay, great. Then we're going to commit for a season, however long a season is. Most sports, it's a three-month cycle. Uh, martial arts, a, a season is usually the first year. <clears throat> but you've got to develop that decision-making process. Hold your kids. Help them to make the decisions and then stick with it. And, you know, totally biased but also very observant, martial arts is literally the best thing you could ever do for your kids if it's something they're interested in exploring. Because... It deals with so much, physically, mentally, emotionally, socially. It deals with conflict, deals with violence. It deals with attitudes, how you show up, influencing peer group, communication. It touches on so many areas of life that it's absolutely the best thing you can do for your kids because no other activity 
deliberately teaches kids how to manage conflict inside themselves and with other people. If you have your kids in a sports team and somebody causes a fight, they kick the kid off the team. They put them in isolation, right? What is a kid learning about how to solve the, that, what caused that situation, what caused that emotion? So I always encourage people, put your kids in martial arts, explore it, see if they're interested. It's not for everyone, but it's for a lot of people and it does such great work. So, but we as adults, we have to make decisions for our kids prior to, or to teach them how to make decisions, teach them how to make commitments and follow through. Okay, now, this right here is just the process of kind of how we move through. And notice there's like a check mark. This is called revolutionary growth. And this is we go down into pain, we revolt against the pain and we get out. Now, it's one thing to go about setting goals and deriving our behavior and doing all these different things, shifting the identity, growing instead of just changing. But there's one other reason why people don't achieve the goals that they set for themselves. And I like to draw kind of a line right about like here, which is between as they, as they go into the pain and they come back out of it, it's hard sometimes to see that identity shift because there's a thing that we don't even know we have that's called secondary gain. And secondary gain is invisible. If somebody actually knew that they were running this pattern, it wouldn't be called secondary gain. It would be called malingering, right? And it's the idea that the benefits we get from having the problem outweigh giving up the problem. And a lot of times people develop a problem. They identify so strongly with the problem, they don't know how or who they would be without it anymore. And to speak specifically to you know members of first responders, military, people who go through traumatic experiences in, in life and death situations, they have post-traumatic stress disorder. And you ask them, you know, what if we could just get rid of it? Well, you can't, but what if we could? They don't really have an answer for who they would be anymore because their identity is so connected to, but I have this problem and that's a way to get connection and they get money and they get, they get special preferential treatment and intellectually they don't want this handout. They don't want this thing, but to truly give it up, they would have to redefine themselves. They can't see that compelling future because the secondary gain puts a blinder over their face. It puts a blinder over their vision internally to say, I, I can never get rid of this. And, Marilyn, hey. And there is an entire culture that reinforces you are damaged and you will never get rid of it and you will always be dependent and you need us because there's a whole bunch of other machinery that gets turned on when somebody is diagnosed that is rewarded for the diagnosis. And it's not politically correct. It's not polite, but there's a lot of money to be made in people's trauma. So I possess a skill set that for a lot of people could just get rid of post-traumatic stress. We could just change your memories, just change the experience. I have um, training in hypnotherapy. I have training in neurolinguistic programming and neurostrategies. I literally could just sit in the space of an hour or two conversation, uh, maybe three or four, but we could just change and shift you back to before the, tra before the trauma. But when you offer that to people, there's resistance. And it's this secondary gain. It's, it's, I don't know who I would be without this thing anymore. And, and they're afraid. And it, it's perfectly normal. It's perfectly natural. I'm not making anybody wrong for pointing this out. But what I'm saying is, if you have been making a commitment to yourself, to other people, hey, I'm going to change. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this better. And then you find intellectually, emotionally, you're there. But operationally, in your life, you're not. That secondary gain is there somewhere, right? In my own life, I know my fitness is not where I would like it to be. I want to get up in the morning and just go and work out. Problem. I love quality time with my wife. I love spending time with her, being around her. So when I wake up, if I just wake up and leave the house to go work out, there's a part of me I feel guilty because, well, I'm leaving her and I'm not taking her with me and um, I'm not taking the time that I have with her to, to like enjoy her. And it's like, but see the problem? It's like, but, but which one do you say is more? Because if I'm in better shape, won't I have more energy to show up with her more powerfully? So then the question becomes, do I want to have quality time or do I want to have quantity time? 
because I'm getting quantity time with my wife, but is it really quality or is it we're allowing ourselves to connect and it actually creates a lower standard because we're not achieving all the goals that we want to be achieving. Now, when we first got together, she would get up and she would go run like four to five miles a morning. She would just be like, all right, I'll see you. Kiss me on the head. Off she went. And it was like over time that dynamic changed a little bit because we got married and it changed just a whole bunch of stuff. So that's a conversation for her and me over the course of this year of looking at where are we putting our priorities physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, financially, relationshipally. And where's our secondary gain? What benefits are we getting by staying where we are versus saying, you know, I say I want to be here, but how do I get there? And that's really the goal, right? Is you say this is what you want, okay, then just remove the things that keep you from getting where you want. So with your kids, helping them as they become 13 to 15, what is it they want? Why do they want it? How would this thing that they're interested in get them there? There's a, one of the dad groups I'm in, there's a guy and his daughter is like, 11 years old and she's in tears trying to decide Olympic level ice skater or Olympic level team, like team uh, synchronized skater. And it's like 11 years old trying to decide which Olympic caliber level direction she wants to go. I don't hear a wrong answer in this. I mean, you're at the elite level. Either way is pretty freaking amazing. And she's in tears because she's stressed. He's like, well, she has to fright at her side. I'm like, dude, the biggest thing is she's 11. Impress upon her. She's already in the, such a small percentile of the human species. High five. There's no wrong answer here. Because it's not about the destination. It's about the journey and who you become in the process. Very few people at 11 years old knew what they wanted to be and then went and became it and it satisfied their life for the rest of their entire life. Almost every single one of us changes and grows and expands and we interact with other lives and change our standards. So it's not all eggs, one basket, 11 years old, you decide your whole entire life now. It's a lot of pressure. So we as adults, we're there, parents, we're laddering for our kids. We're giving them a guideline or a process, a step-by-step -step that they can follow. That's what we're doing for them. We're giving them that step-by-step. -step. So at 13 to 15, we're having that conversation. At nine or 10, we're having that conversation. What do you wanna be? Where do you wanna go? What do you wanna experience? Why this particular activity? Well, my kid doesn't wanna do anything. They just wanna sit on their butt. They just wanna play video games. All right, cool. I got a buddy of mine, his son, one of the top YouTubers for video games. And it's actually work because you have to know what's going on with your audience and what are the current games. You have to make it entertaining and you have to know your metrics and like it's actually work to be really good. But have that conversation. Your kids can actually make money playing video games. That wasn't true when I was a kid. So encourage that conversation. Say, dude, that's interesting. Let's do some research on that. Who are the top 10 people who play, who get paid to play video games online? Cool. How are they similar? How are they different? What makes them popular? Like do some research, get curious and you begin to notice things. You begin to expand things. Okay. So why don't people achieve the things they want? Mainly it's secondary gain. It blocks their vision. But before that, what I said earlier, they still have clear strategy. They change. They get back to balance, but they don't actually improve. They don't actually get better. They just get, it's back to how it used to be. So I encourage you in 2020, get clear on your vision for the future. Get clear on your compelling future. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial, relationship, personal, professional, intimate. Pick one, pick two, get clear. If you wanna have a conversation, we could talk a little bit more in depth, please. Message me, reach out, I'm always available to chat. And uh, that's it for today. So I'm gonna encourage you again, please go and watch the YouTube version of this. It'll be out on Friday, the, um, hold on one second. Friday, the, boop, boop, boop. There it is, Friday the 10th. Friday the 10th, it will be live on my YouTube channel, kungfuhaijeremy.com. Oh, no, no, uh, I'm sorry, not that one. You, it'll be available at YouTube dot com slash kung fu guy jeremy in the playlists there is a parenting program podcast playlist and that has all the episodes and that's it you guys make it an outstanding day make 2020 the best year of your life 
and I will see you when I see you. Bye.